visually on the screen. So, all right, thank you very much. All right, so our first um, question, um, we're gonna do a few sort of broad questions that every room is gonna be receiving and before we dive into the housing specific questions, just so everyone sort of is on the, on the same page of what we're doing here. Um, so the first question, we're gonna start with Lakeisha. Um, and this, the question is, in the past, there have been city hall initiatives that with, with a strong champion on council, but the initiative fades or goes away when the champion leaves. What would you like to see embedded more systemically at the city to support black women and how will you work to achieve it? Yes, yeah, so I think that is one of my uh, initiatives is to ensure that black women uh, entrepreneurship is developed in Cincinnati. And so not only budgeting and creating a financial committee that increases our wealth by 30% throughout um, my term, but it's also to make sure that it's embedded in policies and that we create a structure um, a steering committee where there is other leadership that is um, that is hired from the Cincinnati, um, sorry, that will be hired from uh, the Cincinnati Hall, and that way they can continue the work on. Um, I think another very strong thing for women is going to be youth. Um, I want to make sure that there is a youth-led council, but another signature part of that is going to be a family-led council. As I was raised by a single. My grandma was, uh, she raised me as a single grandparent, even though she was with someone. Um, it took a lot of structure and it took a lot of detail. And I think that we have to make a committee that's dedicated to family and ownership. And through that committee, um, I want to make sure that it is wide reaching and also has partnerships in the city. So not only is it policy directed, but it is owned by other leadership to hold city council accountable um, to the actions that we want to develop. And that will be around gun violence, that will be around uh, ensuring that the family has what they need, that will also be around developing uh, more services that are in the gap that we talk about for women when it comes to pay and scale. Another initiative that I have for women is going to be as organizations are submitting, um, sorry, as organizations are submitting um funding request i want to ensure that we put a policy in place that requires all of them to list their dei for their executive team and their directors and so that will be an ordinance that i would require and a particular policy so that way we make sure that we're giving funding to organizations that have women that are in head position because we need that i think that's it sorry great thank you so much um, next up is Brian, Gary, and the question is in the chat for everyone um, to, to read along if, if you uh, want a reminder. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you so much. So, you know, at City, at City Hall, a lot of times people make motions, uh, motions, you know, don't have any binding agreements, policies that could be changed. You know, there's, we need that continuum of knowledge base, uh, you know, that we used to have, I guess we come up with some, you know, younger city council members that sort of, you know, don't know the past necessarily. But, you know, when, when black women do well, everyone does well. I was recently, uh, and I think Holly, you were in, in the room uh, with um, the, uh, you know, the Cincinnati Foundation and the, the women's, um, you know, focus there. And I was informed about a lot of different things and I appreciated that. One of the things that was mentioned was on the economic uh, scale ladder that black women in fact were at the bottom in many different ways. And so when, what I would recommend at City Hall would be an actual uh, department or division within our city specifically to uplift black women. This would be black women led and uh, black women focused and the staff would be black women. Uh, you know, when you have, uh, an issue of this magnitude in the city. It deserves uh, the full gravity of our city's focus. And, and that's how I would handle it. Uh, because uh, as many people have said, nothing about us without us, or um, that, that the, the people who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. So I would put uh, them in charge of the department as the head of the department and, and all the staff. Time. That's yeah. time. Sorry, great. So yeah, I can't see the timer just for, reference. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we will we will work on that. Um, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, next up is Kurt. 
I, um, I think the first thing is to recognize that champions come and go, but the way you keep getting champions is through events like this. You get to know the people who are running to make sure that your concerns continue to get heard. To build them in systemically in City Hall, as Brian pointed out, is not always easy to do. Uh, but one of the things that I would look to do is build into our ordinance system to make sure that we're doing the things we need to ensure that Black women are lifted up to an equitable stage with everybody else. I mean, I was raised by a mom who was a feminist before they even really knew what the word meant. So I was raised in that environment. My mom created businesses that put people to work. My dad even married into the business. Uh, so I understand what that takes. And I think we have the makings of some of it, but we need to be assured that we have microloans and other uh, opportunities available for black women to get into business. We need to make sure that we provide the child care needs that single moms need who are predominantly African-American in this community. Uh, and we have our money coming to help us do that. But those are things, if you build them into a systemic set of laws, that are a little bit more difficult to change than just on a whim, you build in an approach that starts to remove the inherent bias and starts to put in place a meaningful approach that can last a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Next up is John. John, you're muted. and uh, enact policy, you know, th those are what our, that's what our job is, is to put money where our mouth is and, and, and enact policy. Okay, those are the only 10 things that are gonna change it. And I don't intend to be a, a flash in the pan like the analogy you set up. I intend to get into City Hall and get to work right away for the people, serving the people. Um, I have plans for it. Um, I understand that there's there are historical racism uh, racism built into the system. It's systemic. Um, I don't live my life uh, as a racist. Um, I, I I can see and and see when there are inequities going on, and I don't mind um, going after those inequities. That that's my job. I'm a public servant, and whether you're a black woman in the West End or a white woman um, in North Fairmount. I have to fight for you all the same way. That, that's my job is to fight for all Cincinnatians. But this forum is about black women. And I do recognize many disparities um, that are going on in the black community, whether we're talking about violence and housing and redlining, um, preventing you know, generational wealth programs. I mean, so it's back to the point, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna direct money and policy towards it. For example, um, there are programs, investing community programs that already exist Hi. and then build those programs okay. also. Thank you, John. Yes. Thank you, that's time. Uh, we're gonna move on to Logan. I see you. Not talking to you. The uh, thing we need to do is ensure that we're building institutions that are able to survive the uh, people who create them. So as we want to extend our democracy and deepen it by you know, building, our, building up our community councils and making sure that those are adequately representing everyone in the community. In particular, we should, uh, as we clarify their role, role in government, as I want to do, ensure that uh, they have at least uh, co-chairs, at least one of which is not a man. And, uh, oh my God. Um, beyond that, you need to always be like centering Black women in our policy vision because yeah, you know, when they're free, everyone is free. So paying particular attention to their needs in policy and particular attention to empowering them in policy making through uh, directly democratic processes and through empowering them economically by 
giving them a strong say in the workplace, but through establishing black black and women led cooperatives and uh, preferencing hiring of some thank you. thank you Logan uh, all right thank you everyone uh, we're going to move on to the second question um, this one we are going to be starting with Brian and we'll have the order in the chat as well uh, black women have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic how will you or how can you center these black women in the pandemic recovery process Thank you. You know, I think that many of these questions are better. Uh, I, I would love to hear the answers more about what people have done than what they would do, because the talk is cheap and anyone can say what they would do, but not everyone can say what they have done. So I just want to share with you what I have done in the situation when Sorry, I'm, in, I'm on a busy street in Bond Hill in Reading Road where my office is. And, uh, a lot of motorcycles are going by. But anyway, so here in Bond Hill or, you know, previously in the West End was the restaurant called Just Cook. She had been there for six years. This is Monica Williams, Black female-owned business. She was born in the West End, raised in the West End, lived in the West End, went to school in the West End, was married in the West End. But when the stadium came to the West End, suddenly she was in the way of progress. So ultimately uh, the stadium won, you know, I thought having the stadium there, but ultimately the stadium won. When they offered Monica Williams $20,000, told her to be on her way. I thought that was very unjust. I entered the scene. I fought with four Monica uh, side by side for a year and a half. Eventually, you know, my plan worked that I had spread out the, uh, the pain, so to speak, from the Port Authority to the team and the city. They all kicked in together. When we got done with them, the uh, final uh, negotiated settlement was 250000 Monica was able to relocate into Bond Hill, uh, where she's currently located. Very successful. Brian, that's time. Thank you. Um, next up uh, is Kurt. Thank you. Uh, there's no question that women overall suffered the brunt of the pandemic. We had more women lose jobs. In fact, 100% of women in some areas lost jobs due to the pandemic. And given that African-American women were already on the wrong side of those numbers to begin with, they suffered extraordinarily. And that's what we need to change. We need to get our African-American women back into the workforce where they want to be and when they want to be. Uh, part of what I mentioned before is to make sure we provide the child care and the wraparound services to allow them to do that. It's very frustrating for me when somebody will talk to a mom of two kids who's working two jobs to put food on the table and a roof over their head, and they'll tell her, well, get training for a better job. And the reaction, not surprisingly, is what, with the five minutes I have left to sleep every night? That's where the city has an obligation to step in. If we help her with her child care for her kids, if we help fund her instead of her working two jobs so she can go to school, spend time with her family, and create a platform of moving out of poverty rather than just struggling to get along. We create a hopeful situation for her and her kids, and we remove that whole family out of the no, seemingly never-ending cycle of poverty. We've been at this battle for 50 years and haven't won yet. So these, the situation is not easy and the answers aren't easy, but that's where we have to start. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Next up is John. Thanks again. Um, so, the uh, COVID-19 has really hit Black women the hardest. Um, black women are, are, are raising the kids. Um, they are dealing with affordable housing issues and they've been evicted more uh, are facing eviction at a higher rate than anyone else in Cincinnati. So first I would assist tenants who are facing eviction and help homeowners remain in their homes. Uh, we have to reform the eviction court and make sure we're providing legal access to people. The, the uh, the landlords have have their lawyers and seldomly do the lowest um, income people have any relief. So we are literally putting black mothers and their children out on the street right now and not giving them legal representation. So that's first and foremost. Um, then we have to expand and exp uh, create programs that help low and moderate income women uh, achieve home ownership because that's the real way to generational wealth. We have to make sure 
everything we're doing, we have to look through a lens of uh, racial and economic justice, everything. And uh, we need to invite people into the economy and make sure that, that, that people are uh, getting child care programs, that women are getting child care programs, uh, educational opportunities, and job training, you know, to really join the economy. And uh, we need to focus on who needs the help most now, and that is Black women and children. Um, so my efforts will definitely go into that. And um, I'll thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, next up is Logan. Um, well, fundamentally, we just need to listen to Black women to so we know what actually affects their having and take action based on that and empower them to create solutions you know, collectively on their own. And a lot of that will also involve ensuring that services are reaching them, housing, child care, elder care, access to education, access to healthy food in neighborhoods, <clears throat> the whole gamut of social services that are often just fundamentally unavailable to the, the poorest and especially to black women, even ones who are not the poorest. But empower, listen, provide services. <laughs> That is how we address both the acute after pandemic effects, and that is how we help address the long-term things, as well as providing access to capital so they can invest in themselves and their community more. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. Uh, and last up on this question is Lakeisha. Yes, so I want to make sure that Black women grow their wealth and home ownership is a predominant way to do it in Cincinnati. So not only doing that, but we want to ensure cure, uh, tax abatement and update that policy as it is being addressed in City Hall right now. I want to champion for new home ownerships to receive 100% tax abatement so they wouldn't have to pay. And also for Black women who have already owned a home, for them to get 100% tax abatement. And if they're elderly, uh, putting money aside, of course, working with people who are black, people working cooperatively, our Habitat for Humanity to ensure that their homes are able to be fixed up and maintained. And then as we also have revenue streams that go to each neighborhood and district through the NPR fund, we want to make sure that that money is directed and has portions connected to Black women-led ideas, um, Black women ownership. Um, so that way we know the money and the funding is going into a entrepreneurship programs that sponsor um, Black women so that we can begin to grow the wealth gap in Cincinnati. And as we look at other ideas for Black women, we want to ensure that we continuously develop them outwardly. Um, and so that was going to come through education. I'm excited to be partnering with the Black firefighters. And a lot of Black women um, need trades more than ever, just as things are going on that have the same pay scale um, as their male concept counterparts. And so partnering and ensuring that we work hand in hand. With other, sorry. That's time. Thank you so much, Lakeisha. Um, all right, our next question, um, we'll, we will start with Kurt on this question. Um, the city is set to receive a second round of CARES Act funding for allocation in 2022. How would you use this funding to invest in people? Well, first, let me say, I feel our city council let us down with the first round of financing. They did nothing to change what the mayor proposed and let it just go forward without putting people first. Uh, first off, I think there are three things in particular we should do. One is, as John pointed out, we have too many people get losing their homes. We have 3,000 kids living in cars instead of in homes before they go to school every day. We have to change that. Uh, one thing to do is use part of that money to help keep people in their homes, whether it's an apartment or a residence that they own. Uh, second thing we need to do, and I've talked about this before, is expand the child care availability for people so that they can get to and from work without worrying about running around for their kids. As a parent, I understand this. I've been through this before. My baby's now 35, so it's a little different for me, but I've been there. 
And we need that to help moms and dads focus and, and get to their schools, get to their jobs, whatever they need to do. And the third thing is to roll back that ridiculous tax on our water system. Uh, this city council enacted a series of tax increases on water or water rate increases, but they're really a tax that are destructive. The people who can at least afford it are the ones who need water most and they're gonna have to pay it. The uh, art money is permitted for in the ground infrastructure, which is what that money is supposed to be for. And the water rates should be rolled back so that we don't have people losing their homes because they can't pay for their water. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, next up is John. Sorry, look in the chat to see what the question is. CARES Act money, okay. Um, I didn't mention this before, but you can find out more about my policies um, at mayorforcincinnati.com, also um, on Facebook. Um, but yeah, the, we do have the CARES Act money coming in, and, and this is a great time to address a lot of these disparities and not really have to worry about where, where we're going to get this money from. So this is the time to invest it into um, the Black communities, and particularly um, to making sure that minority and uh, female-owned businesses are getting funding. Um, this is a great time to take money from the CARES Act to invest in the housing um, incentives that I mentioned earlier to increase the homeownership. Um, this money needs to be dis distributed uh, equitably so that everyone is lifted up by this. And um, I hate to, would hate to uh, see people get in there and uh, make sure that money went to special, special interests um, or didn't see this pop sec segment of the population. So I will be in there uh, fighting for the equity and development of the black community for sure. Um, I hate to mention this, but um, my wife is black. She's a teach uh, principal over at Reese Price. Half of my family is black. I grew up in um, in this inner city, so I care about all my neighborhood, all my neighbors. And uh, but now it's time to make sure that money reaches the black community. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next up is Logan. So as a rule, I think uh, money that we is like provided on a short term basis that will be going away shouldn't be spent on starting programs. So we're then going to have to worry about where we get money from it in the future. It should be spent on basically investing in infrastructure, the structure of the city, capitalizing, investing in businesses, things like that. So I would spend the bulk of it on building new social housing in the city so that all communities, but yeah, especially poor minority communities have access to affordable housing at well below market rates that they have democratic control over, things like that. And in furthering our efforts to remove lead from our water system and lead paint programs and de working on remediating environmental damage in some of our uh, more blighted industri former early industrial areas, things like that. We'll take a up big upfront investment but have long-term benefits going forward and some of which might even be able to help pay for themselves in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Logan. Uh, next up on this question is Lakeisha. Yeah, so I wanna make sure that the funding goes directly to the things that are affecting the city the most right now. And so that would go, a portion would go to housing um, and to ensuring that we have more affordable housing in Cincinnati not only rental property, but also home ownership. And then secondly, is to look at all the gun violence going on. We have lost a lot of programs that are significant that need to be funneled um, in the city so we can address the youth. We also need to make sure that the youth-led uh, ideas are at the forefront. Um, so really ensuring, especially the councils that we have going on, we have a huge significant councils like in Avondale and Bond Hill, 
And I really want to make sure that we sponsor these ideas from a city and then go around them with different agencies. And then secondly, is as we are funding nonprofits and securing that they grow and support the different women in Cincinnati is having them submit their diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then essential, a portion of it will go directly to Black um, leadership. Um, so ensuring that these are Black-led ideas and that they are ran by Black women um, to ensure that they are getting the source of the money at the at the at their disposal. So they can really make the effects of their community uh, continuously and that they can reach uh, their population that that fits them and that we grow um, in the next season. I really think that's going to be important is that we push that money to the people that need it most and also that can lead in the areas of expertise. Hi. Thank you, Lakeisha. Uh, and last on this question is Brian. Thank you so much for the great question. Again, it's about, I think, before someone goes to serve, what have they done and what are they doing today? Um, not yesterday, but today, I'm, you, in fact, using uh, CARES Act funding. Uh, the names of Valerie Lane uh, may be familiar to you. She's the West Side woman, African-American woman who through no fault of her own, as being evicted. The city has shut her building down on Queen City. Her ceiling is falling in. She's in a flooded situation with water everywhere. You can look her up on WCPO. I am uh, tomorrow signing with her uh, new housing. Uh, finally got her out of that situation. We have such a housing crisis that it, normally I can find people housing very quickly. Uh, in this situation, we are using some CARES Act funding, but it did take a while. The other name is Karen Willingham, uh, found her permanent uh, supportive housing yesterday, African-American woman. You can look her up on uh, Fox 19. Her situation, again, she was being evicted uh, through no fault of her own. She lost her subsidy. She hadn't left her house for 18 months uh, due to COVID and lost her subsidy because she missed an appointment uh, for her subsidy. I was called in to, to support, and this is what Hi. I've learned in the past couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, you know, we've touched on housing a bit in these questions. Now we're gonna ask several questions that are more specific um, to the housing issue. So for the first question, John uh, is gonna lead us off. And the question is, like many communities across the country, Access to affordable housing is a key issue in Cincinnati. As a city council member, how would you prioritize addressing this issue? Thank you, Holly. Um, I didn't mention this earlier with the CARES money, but uh, we need to make sure that uh, we are addressing um, affordable housing with that money. Uh, like I said, this is a time where we won't have to worry about paying that money back or where we come up with it. Um, but I would look at, um, sorry, essentially we have to take a creative approach to public housing and start working with, uh, builders who, um, put inclusive affordable housing at the forefront instead of working with, uh, builders that are interested in luxury condominiums. So that's up to council and the mayor to work with those folks. So I think that's a main thing that I bring to the table here is I'm not um, looking to serve myself with affordable housing. I'm making sure that the community is uh, being served. But I, th I have some ideas for um, putting affordable housing in, in the west side, Price Hill, um, and making sure that we are kicking out and dealing with uh, Section 8 landlords and slumlords so that residents can report these people. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next up is Logan. So <clears throat> the basic deal that I want to make with housing is that there would be a lot less sort of politically, political favoritism going to private developers. You know, 
tax abatements, things like that. And a lot more mo money going to city owned housing, community owned democratic housing, things like that. But in exchange, we would loosen zoning rules so that housing can be built more easily, cheaply, and densely. And this is the basic mechanism that will lower housing costs by directly competing with the market as you know, by providing some market rate housing and by increasing supply and also you know, creating a tenant's bill of rights so that renters have a much stronger legal position and instituting rent stabilization so that yeah, you know, rents just can't be jacked up willy nilly. There's a lot more detail to go into that, but that's the basic architecture of how I want to address housing. Thank you, Logan. Um, next up on this question is Lakeisha. Yes. Uh, so this is one of my number one priorities, but and and not but but in a section, it also has to be connected to how are we creating a system for affordable housing? As I have worked in nonprofit before, um, finding affordable housing is a long, tedious process. And so I want to make sure that there is an internal system that someone can go to a website and it lists all of the affordable housing units in Cincinnati. This also cuts down on slumlords. It also lets us look at the really availability throughout the Cincinnati area. Um, I just had a friend apply for affordable housing and when she showed up, they denied her, even though they said on the phone, they did accept it. Um, and she, it was probably the way she was dressed, right? And I think it, sometimes when people see a certain personality come to the door is different and that allows for discrimination. Secondly, as big metropolitan cities, when they do give tax abatements to new developers, they require them to have affordable housing units connected. And this is based on um, how much the priority is and how much the tax abatement is. And so essentially they also have a lottery system. So anybody would be able to go into this new rental and be able to stay there. And it, it also would be on the website. So there would be no discrimination and it would allow for more community access. And then finally, it would be allowing more people to zone their home. So we can change it, but I would only do zoning in certain communities that request it. Thank you. Thank you, Lakeisha. Uh, next up is Brian. Yeah, so affordable housing, as uh, many of you probably know, is my life and soul. I am the construction manager for working in neighborhoods where we are creating a building affordable housing in College Hill and in Cumminsville. In fact, this housing is what is a whole neighborhood. We're, we're creating an affordable housing net zero neighborhood. And what net zero means is that there will be no utility bills for those who residents who occupy this affordable housing. Um, in most of the time, uh, in my experience in working with neighbor, working with working in neighborhoods, we have in fact uh, sold the affordable housing to uh, head of household black women uh, throughout Cumminsville. So, I think it's uh, important as to not just uh, you know, what we do, but, but how we do things. And in uh, this particular area, I think it's crucial to support affordable housing uh, for African-American women head of households, because in fact, it is this, uh, this socioeconomic class that needs affordable housing the most, as you probably know, uh, our critical need is in the 30% uh, of AMI uh, category to which the majority of the African uh, women, yes, are in that category. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and last up is Kurt. Hey, thank you. First, let me apologize now because after I answer this question, as Holly knows, I, I have to step out for about 20 minutes. Uh, but on answering to this one, I think an underlying problem to many of the issues we face is poverty. We need to elevate people, not just to a living wage, but to a family sustainable wage. 
uh, and we're not doing that right now, but we can, as I talked about many times, provide the wraparound child care, provide the opportunity to support the individuals. I think if you take a look at what Scholar House does on a very small scale, that's what I'm talking about on a supercharged scale. You can help people move up and out of the poverty cycle they're in so that they and their families have hope for the future and suddenly move into a spectrum where they can afford housing on a more equitable basis. But we also need to look at how we're funding because every time somebody comes forward and says, well, let's throw money at it, which is how the city reacts to most everything, they expect a different result every time. And you're not gonna get a different result because nobody's taking the time to put together a real plan by working with the stakeholders in this community, the big businesses, the small businesses, the experts, the builders, upscale developers, uh, affordable housing developers, and most importantly, the people who are living it to understand what their needs are and how to get to the answer. I think that's what we need on city council and that's where I would focus my energy. So thank you and I hope I'll see you all in about 20 minutes. Thank you, I look forward to bringing you back in. Um, we're gonna move on to our next question. Uh, this one, John will start us off with. Um, and the question is, ex please explain your understanding of how housing is tied to health, justice, education, and economic mobility. You're on, John, you're on mute. You can start. All right, <laughs> thanks again. <laughs> thanks, Holly. Happens to all of us. It does, thank you. Um, as, as I understand it, they are very closely related. Um, your your um, levels of health um, are, are I'm, I need to look this question up, sorry. Okay, your level of health, um, education and economic mobility are, are usually tied in to where your housing is. Um, typically the poorest communities uh, do not leave the areas that they are born uh, many, many years later. Um, so we're talking about economic mobility um, in some of the poorest communities of our city. Um, so the idea is to help uplift um, the folks in these communities. Uh, my wife and I are working on better access to education um, and uh, also health and justice are a lot of the poor neighborhoods are usually where the most pollution is too, you know, and our city really needs to be addressing that. Um, we need to uh, kind of take an assessment of the communities that are hardest hit um, with health issues. And it's, it's not gonna be any surprise that they're the poorest, blackest communities. We already know that, but the key is to actually care enough to address these disparities. Um, Another way housing is tied to health is by your access to public transit. If your housing is not uh, near Hi. public transit, you have trouble getting to the doctors or going to get food, which is another aspect tied to your health. Um, thank you. That's time. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up is Logan. Yeah, so there are a few fundamental ways this is they're going to be tied together. One is just the quality of the housing will affect your health. If you have housing which is drafty and mold ridden, you obviously have much poorer health. If you have housing which doesn't have easy access to, you know, good quality food or any kind of amenities, you'll have poorer health, poorer access to education, poorer economic mobility. If you're, and if you're spending a significant portion of your money on barely affording rent, obviously you're gonna have poor access to economic mobility, poor access to healthcare, which is obviously also expensive, poor access to basically anything. If you're tied to precarious housing, in underserved neighbor neighborhoods, your access to justice is uh, much poorer because you're mostly receiving the boot heel end of the justice system and not the service end of it. 
I mean, effectively, effectively, yeah. Poor quality, expensive housing makes everything you can imagine much harder and much more dangerous and much worse for you. All right, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next up is Lakeisha. Yes, yeah, so as we know, systemic uh, racism is also tied into all of these things as well. And if you can look at the gaps in Cincinnati, when you look at redlining, when you look at high interest rate, when you look at um, the grocery store and there are the lack of initiatives, you can see that those are also tied to those housing departments where we don't check behind slumlords. Um, we allow buildings to go down, which we infect people's health because there is no grocery store. Um, justice is usually served at the people that are committing crimes at the highest, even though they may be trying to get their basic needs. Education cannot be funneled if you are hungry and not well served. And there is a lack of economic mobility as even a black woman being paid significantly her worth in Cincinnati compared to others. And so when you have all of those things tied together, there becomes a circle of um, just iniquities that continuously rail behind it. And I think it's time that we really partner together and kind of address those issues with creating partnerships to address the lack of the food deserts in Cincinnati, to address slumlords in Cincinnati, to address health um, care in Cincinnati. As much money as we have put into the vaccines, we didn't do a lot of wraparound program for Black women who needed that additional support. And so I think we have to include those things in the way we fund money now. Thank you. Uh, last up on this question is Brian. So you, you, you may know that I work day in and day out with those experiencing homelessness and having mental health issues in our city. <clears throat> There's no uh, coincidence that these are one and the same people. Because as you probably also know, Ronald Reagan in 1984, 85, um, defunded our state uh, mental health facilities across our country. And he created homelessness. Uh, he created homelessness today as we know it. Previously here in Cincinnati on Summit Avenue, or Summit Road, uh, was the, well, was called Longview at the time, but at any rate, uh, 5,000 people resided there today, 285 people reside there. Those individuals and the individuals at Roman, uh, uh, Romans and Clifton on Martin Luther King, uh, those, they no longer have those services. So basically the people who are living on our streets who have mental health issues are those who we've left and relegated them to the streets because we could support them. We could provide housing for them, but we've chosen not to as a society. And that's why they are living on our streets because essentially our society does not care about them. And um, that is a connection between uh, health and justice. Uh, Winton Hills, as it's now called, Winton Terrace as I grew up uh, in the area was called. Am I over, is it over already? Hi. <laughs> okay. 90 seconds goes fast. It goes very quickly. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you for bearing with us on, on the timing. I know that it is tough. Um, we're going to move on to the next question now. This one, um, Logan is going to start us off for the next question. Um, many city and community leaders have indicated a commitment to invest in historically Black neighborhoods. How will you ensure that these spaces are created to be supportive of Black women in particular? I think the key thing is to make sure that Black women are taking a leading role in decision-making about how these sorts of funds are being dispersed. As I mentioned earlier, that every uh, community council should have co two co-chairs, at least one of which should be you know, not a man. <laughs> and there should also be you know, independently organized women's structures within those uh, you know, democratic institutions to advocate for their point of view both separately and within the uh, 
community structure so that when these funds and services are coming in, they are able to direct how they're set up and how, how the money is spent so that they're getting the most act, most bang out of the out of the buck for their needs and their priorities. And personally I find 90 seconds to be plenty of time to get my points across. Fair enough. Succinct is also good too. Um, next up is Lakeisha. Yeah, so as I talked about before, I think it's going to be essential that Black women are, uh, are leading the steering committees to decide what is essential for their communities and what is essential for their neighborhoods as we're going to grow. Um, as they have usually led high leadership when it comes to volunteering in a social service atmosphere, usually the funding doesn't necessarily support those ideas. And so I want to make sure that not only they're making those decisions, but we're also giving funding to those communities. And essentially with those communities, we want to make sure that there's also a lot of partnerships around the development of those ideas. So stepping in to ensure that as we are looking at food deserts, what um, black owned female market can be served um, and how can we develop those things in the community. As we have saw in Bond Hill, there is a lot of different opportunities for black women who have said, we want to do this, we are growing these things and we want to be developers. And so I think those need to be essential. And then finally, priorities frequently mentioned. Um, I think it's gonna be essential that we look at uh, just uh, the ownership continuously going on Black women. It's got to just make sure we put them at the head of the table, but also put the money behind them at the head of the table. And I think that's going to be critical as we look at it and having other people that are holding us accountable as well. Thank you, Lakeisha. Uh, next up is Brian. Sorry, it didn't put me on quick enough. Um, yeah, so as the chair of Neighborhoods United, I work with, in fact, uh, Black women across our city, Black homeowners. Uh, every week we have a meeting, sometimes twice a week, dealing with this issue of gentrification in our city and will Black women homeowners have the opportunity to even continue as they are their very concern. Women in Evanston and Madisonville and Walnut Hills in the West End, even in Bond Hill, you know, I'm here in Bond Hill. This is my office on Reading Road uh, where I grew up and people are concerned and people are concerned for a good reason because our city council has not prioritized black women or anyone who doesn't seem to be a billionaire, but I have fought gentrification in the West End, in Bond Hill, which was called, uh, when I was a kid, Swifton Village, then Huntington Meadows, and it was completely annihilated and gentrified overnight, and 6,000 people kicked out of their homes uh, in, in 1998. Um, and I fought that, and I organized them, and we took it to federal court. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a, a friendly federal court at that time. But I also organized in English Woods where we went. Hi. Okay. Right. Thank you, Brian. Um, and last up on this question is John. Thank you, Holly. Um, you're right, a lot of uh, leaders do talk about this, but. Um, the, the number one way I see to ensure um, that these spaces are created to be supportive, particularly of black women is to engage the black female community. Um, so I would set out to do that. Um, I would engage prominent uh, female black leaders in our community. Um, I would start by going to the sororities around Cincinnati like Delta Sigma um, Theta or Sigma Ga Gamma Rho or Zeta Phi, I, I would in engage the black women who are already leading the fields on this and ask, him the, ask them to come into the neighborhoods um, to 
uh, engage to to listen through what the community residents are saying. I don't think it's a great look for a white man from Cincinnati to go into a black neighborhood and, and act like or pretend that he knows what's best for their community. So I would engage the leaders of that community, um, not just the sororities, but also the fraternities and the black churches who have a great deal of power here in the community. Um, they know what's going on in the community and they know what needs um, to be done to address it. And I am ready, willing, and prepared to work with them and be a catalyst of change for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for to move on to the next question. Uh, this question, uh, Lakeisha will start us off. Um, what are your plans to fund the Affordable Housing Trust Fund? Yes, so as everybody requested the Affordable uh, Trust Fund to be funded, it actually was funded. I think there is money in Cincinnati um, that we don't necessarily talk about in the budget. Um, so as we looked at the budget of where they pulled and pieced it from, uh, not exactly certain um, because that was a lot different, but my number one concern is going to be funding it and ensuring that we do fund it without raising our taxes um, next year. And I think essentially by not raising our taxes is going to be not our earned income tax is essentially the money that we do get from downtown. And I know a lot of politicians have talked about they don't think we'll get that same amount. And I think that is true. And that is why we cannot continuously fund everything that is downtown. And that is why we have to invest in all 52 neighborhoods and grow our business district so that we will continuously have more funding throughout Cincinnati and not rely on our economic system downtown to fund every single project we need um, because it hasn't worked essentially in the last year, within the last two years. And it will not work within the next two years either as people are still quitting work and not coming back into downtown. Um, so my agenda is to continuously fund it and to determine how the money will be um, played or pushed from different en entities because uh, as we saw as a result, their funding was essentially available as soon as election season came up. Thank you. Uh, next up is Brian. Yeah, thank you. So as you probably know, um, my mom wrote the Affordable Housing Trust Fund legislation. Her, as the president of the Affordable Housing Advocates, handed it to David Mann, who then signed it into law. I um, very clearly, uh, the way we would fund the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is through developer fees, uh, which would be tens of millions each year. Uh, through the railroad that we own that goes down into Kentucky, which would be about 18 million uh, per year, and through the uh, taxing of stock options, which we always previously taxed until 1996 when council decided that they would give the rich a break and not tax their stock options. So uh, this is a very simple, uh, you know, holding harmless uh, the public in terms of how to fund affordable housing. It doesn't raise people's taxes. It doesn't uh, harm, it's not a regressive tax. It's not even a tax at all. So just to reiterate, uh, funding would come from the railroad, which we own 18 million per year. It would come from uh, developer fees, which they're making money off of the city and usually they get subsidies. There's barely ever a uh, project that doesn't receive city subsidies and uh, through taxing stock options. I mean, people get paid in stocks and they should pay their fair share, and that money should then go to affordable housing. That's how I would fund the Affordable Housing Trust. Hi. Thank you. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, one second. I do, like Kirk, have to hop off for like 23 minutes. I will try to, uh, you know, I will hop back on. I'm sorry that I have to duck out just for a second and I'll uh, join you back in. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Uh, next up is uh, John. Thanks again for this uh, question. I'm not muted, right? <laughs> um, to make sure that we are uh, funding the Affordable Housing Trust, we need to pursue creative options um, to where we can uh, leverage city dollars 
um, I continue to mention the CARES Act. We can fund it with the CARES Act, which we will have next year. Um, I also think it's important to try to partner with the federal government in particular on this and also Hamilton County. Um, and then we have to uh, work with builders and businesses. We, we have to try to take a comprehensive um, approach to this. Again, always looking through the lens of uh, socio and economic and racial justice. And um, maybe, they, I don't know, we just have to be open-minded and try to explore every possible option for this. Um, one thing that I'd like to bring, that I bring to the table is the ability to work well with others. Um, and I am passionate enough about trying to find affordable housing for Cincinnatians that I will talk to just about anybody. I'll go ask Warren Buffett for a loan. I mean, um, essentially, I'm willing to work tirelessly to make sure we find a way to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, and last up on this question is Logan. Yeah, as Brian mentioned, there are sort of funding mechanisms that were built into the original approval and we should be using them. Beyond that, um, I would like to establish a public bank for the city of Cincinnati, which will help fund it in two ways. It will reduce financial service fees that the city pays. That money can then be redirected towards the trust fund. And it will also give us access to much cheaper uh, loans that we could then use to fund housing, which we would be able to make somewhat self-sustaining because we should be building mixed income social housing where the higher income levels that are using it are, able, are helping to subsidize and fund access by lower uh, income levels and pay for development of future housing, as well as you know, making it mixed use so that we don't have commercial real estate that is also helping to fund that housing development for the city for the there's affordable housing. And I also think we can take a little bit of money from the police budget and apply it to housing so that we have fewer problems that they would then have to spend money on later. A long-term solution so we're not having so many short-term problems. That about covers it. Great, thank you all very much. Um, so I don't know if everyone saw on the top of their screen, um, we have about 10 minutes left in this before returning back to the main session. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this one, uh, John will begin this question. Um, research has indicated disparities in sale prices between homes owned by black families and those owned by white families. What role do you think the city should play in addressing these inequities in Cincinnati? Thanks, Holly. Um, this is a real, a very real issue. Um, and I've, I've had it happen to family members um, who, who had their houses for sale and then have the home appraiser come in and uh, black family members who have, have come in. And um, we actually kind of, we knew this was happening. So next door neighbors were white that came in, took their pictures down and uh, hung the pictures of white families and uh, the appraisal had come in at least $50,000 higher than when they had their own pictures up. And um, it's, it's just a, a shame. Uh, what can the city do to, um, to, to change that? Um, I'm open to, to hearing suggestions on it, short of um, reviewing all the appraisals coming through this community. Uh, I'm, I'm not 100% what, what we can do. Um, but if anyone ever hears about this, please let me know. I will go after them with a fervor. Um, I know there are housing opportunities made equal as a program. Um, I have friends who's, who are in business, whose profession it is to uh, hold people accountable to these type of injustices. Um, I also think it's important, Lakeisha Cook mentioned this earlier, um, people working cooperatively. I think it's, it's important that we are funding people working cooperatively so that uh, the programs that are in place um, don't displace or harm the people. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next on this question is Logan. Probably our best bet for doing this is to have uh, the city equality commission running stings on appraisers so that we can find out who is doing this and take action against them. Um, yeah. See them see sanctions, whatever exactly, whatever exact legal mechanisms are available to ensure that uh, appraisals are happening fairly, we should pursue. It's going to be a pain to root this out, but it's something we should pay attention to and keep at. About it. Thank you. Uh, Lakeisha. Yes, this is significantly um, a tragedy, and it's also happening a lot in Evanston and Mad uh, Madisonville as a lot of people, elderly people, were being moved out of their home um, as they were also being targeted uh, for you know not updating their houses. And so I think this is essential because it is discrimination. Um, and as he mentioned before, is working with legislation to make it um, to ensure that whenever one we track these people who are doing audits. So essentially in Cincinnati, we do not um, hold people accountable. We do not hold some lawyers accountable. We do not hold people who discriminate accountable and we allow them to still continuously operate these businesses in Cincinnati um, under the same section, under the same um, ruling. And so my, one of my ordinances would be uh, in a policy with the slum lords is that you cannot um, number one, submit a report. And then if you do, um, get found guilty of discrimination, then you would not only have to complete the compliance with um, homes, which they make you do, but also you would have to complete a compliance with the city and you will be paid, you will be required to pay a large sum of uh, funding, um, maybe 10,000, um, just so we can also learn to de deter this. Um, I think when you target people at like a high quality and also you require that if they do get hit with so many sanctions in our community, then your title could be stripped at a local level because we wouldn't hold it um, authority. Sorry. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Um, we have no more questions. You have all um, done an amazing job. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, you know, I know that there we, you know, there were a lot of great ideas shared. So we really appreciate everyone being here today. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, if our if our timekeeper is able to do this, but we have a couple minutes left. So I don't know. We I think we have time for maybe thirty seconds for your final thoughts from from each of you. Um, so we will start with Lakeisha. Yes, I'm really excited and I'm going to go after affordable housing, not only affordable housing, but also affordable home ownership for African Americans in the community. I want to make sure that our wealth gap um, increases and that Black women are not only leading initiatives, but the initiatives are being funded in the city and we're directing the community um, with support as we engage um, in the next two years. And I want to do that with you all. I know that's going to take a lot of bit of teamwork, but I understand that you have already been doing the work. So I just want to make sure you get the authority. Thank you. Uh, Logan. Yeah, as, as we uh, move forward in the city, I want to develop a culture of solidarity with democratic participation everybody in the city is empowered to affect policy and so that we can build a uh, culture here where embodies the principle that the injury to one is an injury to all and we will collectively work together to lift everyone up great thank you uh and john Thank you. I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, I get, I'm very passionate about these, about what happens to my neighbors. Um, first off, as a human being, um, a brother, a sister, 
And then secondly, as a husband to an African-American woman, I take personally uh, the injustices that happen to the African-American community. Uh, essentially as a human being, I, I hate seeing it. Um, I want you to know that I have the passion, the drive and the determination to go to bat for the community, um, to uplift all Cincinnati residents. And I, would, I am asking you for you to vote for me now through November 2nd. My name is John Mayer. My website is mayorforcincinnati.com. Um, I look forward to getting to work and hoping to build a team with you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. Thanks to all of our candidates. Um, and for all the participants who are watching, we will be sending out uh, a, a follow-up email with links to candidate um, websites, Facebook pages and things. So you can follow up and do research um, on your own on all the candidates here. Uh, and this, all of these sessions will also be posted online as well. So for the sessions you weren't able to attend, you'll be able to go back and look at the recordings there as well. So I want to give everyone, um, once again, all of our candidates, you did a great job. I know that this format um, was, was tight and it was tough. You all did a fabulous job. So really appreciate you taking the time to be here. I know it's a busy time for you all. Um, and I want to wish you the best of luck over the next few weeks. Um, we're really, uh, I'm excited, sort of personally excited to see so many people running and, and, um, and stepping up to take on leadership in Cincinnati. It's a really important time. So thank you all for, for doing this today. And I think with that, um,